Um, so I, I do have a few disclaimers. Uh, I don't actually have any conflicts with industry or industry sponsorship. Um, I know that I have included uh, more slides than I would normally for a talk of this length, and that's partly because of this issue of, of people being able to download it later. Um, I, there are a lot of references which I could have included, and it's just, it's just not physically possible to put them all in. Uh, the slides would be unwatchable if I did. Uh, but I would direct people, if they want to look at the actual source information for a lot of this uh, that I'm going to be presenting, the Health Canada website has a very good list. There's thousands of reference on there, references on there, and uh, I'm sure you'll be able to, to get what you need from there. Um, I'd also like to, um, to say that you know, I'm not a physiologist. I don't do research in um, cannabinoid, cannabinoid pharmacology or anything like that. I just, I'm, I'm a palliative care physician that works in a, a, um, an oncology pain clinic uh, with lots of other symptoms that come up. And I'm really presenting uh, my perspective as a clinician uh, from what I've learned from my patients. I don't, do, don't see patients with fibromyalgia, chronic back pain, you know, post neuralgia and those sorts of things as a major part of what I do, though I do have a few patients with those problems. My focus is primarily the cancer setting. So please don't extrapolate this, the information that I'm going to be presenting to all kinds of, of uh, medical situation that is not, not related to cancer. Um, and of course, um, this is a general presentation. I can't um, comment on any particular cases. Um, and the last part is we still know very little about um, about cannabis, and I think it's an incredibly promising uh, plant. Uh, we, we certainly have a lot more work to do, but hopefully in even a year's time, if I was asked to do this talk again, I'd be able to give you a lot better information. Um, and before I get started, I would like to really acknowledge um, some of my colleagues, particularly Conrad Oja, um, who's, um, who did a lot of the work with the literature review, and I borrowed shamelessly from some of his slides. Um, Arnold Choche, who's had a tremendous amount of experience from a practical perspective with patient care. Um, Gwilin Goddard, Michael Negreff as well, very knowledgeable in this area, uh, who um, offered to share some slides with me. And then many of the patients who've taught me a lot about um, what I know about medicinal cannabis. A lot of what I'm, I'm um, presenting is not in the textbooks. Um, and also the, uh, the staff at the dispensaries that the patients have, um, uh, that I see have gone to, because many of them have come back speaking very highly of them and I've certainly appreciated their expert help. So over the next hour, I'm hoping that um, the healthcare professionals that are attending are going to be able to uh, be comfortable with being able to explain to their patients about um, how medicinal cannabis might work and what sort of situations it would be most appropriate to use. Uh, but also, there are situations where it should be avoided, and there are some safety concerns which they need to be aware of. Uh, and then, obviously, part two, I'm going to be talking about the practical aspects. The objectives for patients, because I don't know how many of you are going to be patients we're going to be asking in a little while, is for you to have a good understanding that, um, that medicinal cannabis isn't a, a panacea, but that it might have a role for certain situations. So when is it that it might, would be most likely to be helpful? And if you're thinking of trying it, what you need to be careful of. Um, so uh, just before we start, can um, you do this poll? Um, if you could just indicate uh, with the poll, Michael will help us here, which of the following job descriptions describes you best? Just so we can get a little bit of an idea of what my audience is. Yeah, so we're going to open the poll. You should see it appearing um, on the right hand of your screen. And we have five minutes now for people to vote. I see people are, are voting, and we'll give people just a, a minute to register their answer. Don't worry, we're not going to wait five minutes with every poll. No. <laughs> <laughs> just, just fire it up quickly. Right, and so the results, um, we have 34% of, of uh, respondents are physicians, followed by 18% uh, who didn't answer, 16% are other health care professionals, 15% nurses, 10% pharmacists. So the vast majority are physicians. Okay, any patients or families? Uh, we've got 2% uh, patients and 2% uh, families of patients. Okay, okay. So the so majority of my audience is healthcare professionals. Good, because I have um, included a lot of stuff that I think would um, would be more appropriate for healthcare professionals there. And so I'm sorry for those few patients of you out there um, if, if some of this is a little overly medical, uh, but I've actually been amazed by how well-informed many of my patients are. So I wouldn't dream of patronizing that you wouldn't get it. 
Uh, but we do feel free to ask questions if you need to. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Um, if you are a patient, well, I'm actually going to skip this if you don't mind, Michael, because um, sure. I, uh, there's not enough people left. It's only 2% yeah. so it's be meaningful. Um, the next one, if you are a doctor, um, I'm so uh, the 30-odd percent of you out there who, who are physicians, could you just indicate whether or not you have done authorizations for medicinal cannabis? Um, so yes, if you have done uh, one uh, for one of the dispensaries or a Health Canada form. And we're receiving answers now. Let's wait until we have at least 50% of people have them answered. I want to get an idea of whether I've got a, a, a people that are, have really never done this before or whether you're kind of experienced and looking for kind of extra tips. We have a, a fairly even split between those that have and have not, those physicians that have 19% um, have and uh, 15 compared to 15 who have not. Okay, great. Okay, so um, starting back at the beginning, um, the endocannabinoid system is, is a very old system. It actually goes right back to you know, common ancestors of animals and plants. Um, and the, um, it's kind of like the endogenous opioid system where we have enkephalins and endorphins with uh, appropriate receptors throughout our nervous system and our tissues uh, that can be exploited by exogenously administered opioid-like molecules. The cannabinoid system is very similar. Um, we have these receptors and um, these molecules that stimulate or um, oppose the receptors throughout our nervous system. Um, there are two main endocannabinoids in, in humans, um, the anandamide and the 2-AG, as I've uh, put up there. Um, and these endocannabinoids are synthesized and degraded by the liver. There are two primary types of cannabinoid receptors in the tissues, the CB1 and CB2. And um, they are distributed differently throughout our bodies. Uh, the CB1 receptors are primarily in the nervous system, and the CB2s in the immune system, so on the surface of lymphocytes, etc. And actually, different species have different distributions of these receptors. Um, so the example I've given there is of the, the rat basal ganglia and, and cerebellum being much more sensitive in the, than in humans to cannabinoids. So um, if you try and do animal studies on the effects of cannabinoids, they will not be uh, the same as the results you would get from humans. Um, so you know, if you give a rat a little bit of cannabinoid, they fall right over. They can't stand up straight, but um, humans can tolerate a lot more. Um, so the, the, this does affect um, the, the research as we move forward and that we do need to have animal models. Um, we need to have human models, not animal models, to be able to do a lot of this research. Um, there are also uh, differences between the receptor distribution and where we see the endocannabinoids, which suggests that there's probably more to this story than meets the eye and that this sim simplified view of having just two types of receptors and two types of endocannabinoids is probably a gross oversimplification. Um, the, uh, the functions that we know about that the endocannabinoid system can, um, can act in are, are as, as up here. There's a great long list, and I'm going to start with the, uh, the important ones. Um, hippocampal neurogenesis, so memory formation, uh, very much involved. Um, appetite, um, everyone that's used marijuana recreationally will be aware of the munchies that they get afterwards. Um, they, um, they're involved in metabolism, so they have a, an effect on um, how well our livers work, how our fat storing cells work, um, our GI tract, etc. And interestingly, though, there is um, a interest uh, in the possibility of cardiovascular toxicity. There may actually be a cardiovascular preventative role as well for some cannabinoids. The endocannabinoid system uh, it also is involved in the stress response. Uh, there's, you can get excitatory and uh, calming effects depending on uh, the different uh, ways that um, and, uh, the exogenous cannabinoids are, um, are administered and, and what content they have. And, um, and this is because there's a, this is balanced between the, uh, the different um, if, uh, excitatory and calming effects. Um, immune function, female reproduction, we've talked, uh, we haven't talked about, but that is an, an issue as well. Um, intestinal motility, pain perception, which is a very common reason for using um, exogenous cannabinoids, and also sleep. Um, so if you look at the cannabis plant, there are essentially there are two uh, main uh, groups. There's the sativa group and the indica group, and the leaves uh, look quite different. But many of the, uh, the cannabis 
uh, varieties that we see nowadays are actually hybrid. Um, so it's not as easy to be able to put, um, to label one as either sativa or indica now. Uh, there are many that are, um, are kind of halfway between the two. And um, this is just a picture of the uh, sort of the flower or the bud from a, a cannabis plant. Um, looking up closer, these are these uh, pistils, which are um, where a lot of the active ingredients um, of uh, medicinal cannabis are to be found. And this is what it, it can look like in commercial production. This is an outside facility. Um, it looks, if you look closely, a little bit like a, um, a prison camp with a, um, you know, a great big fence and, a, and a, a post for somebody to stand in with a gun, like in a, a prison of war camp. But um, so you can see that security has to be quite a big issue with these commercially um, uh, producing uh, farms. Um, these are some samples of dried marijuana, and uh, you know, they they all look much of a muchness uh, when they're dried. Um, they, they can, however, um, have um, some quite uh, amazing names like train wreck. <laughs> Purple Kush is quite a common one. Um, Bubba Kush, there's a, there's a whole number of, uh, of different kinds of, um, of medicinal marijuana you can get. But when you powder it and it was dried and powdered, um, essentially it all looks the same. This is a typical dispensary. Uh, we have um, a variety of, of different products lined up and a knowledgeable person who's behind the counter there to try and help advise you as to which one uh, might, be, uh, might be proper. So just another quick question. Have um, those of you that are, are on and live here today, could you just let me know whether you've tried cannabis yourself? Obviously, this is not going anywhere beyond here. I just want to get an idea of, of how comfortable people are with using marijuana recreationally. So we've got a lot of people answering. Which is great. Just leave another. Five You're not seconds. a sweet day yet. <laughs> <laughs> We've got yeah. We have 53% um, of respondents have tried cannabis. 25 uh, have not, and 21% have no answer. Not that, okay. So a fairly experienced group. So you're ahead of me in some ways in this because I have to admit to never having personally tried it. Um, I've never been um, sick enough um, to need it, um, and I've never had um, any. Um, urge to try it recreationally. Perhaps I should do sometime. Um, so those of you that have tried it, what form did you take it in? If you can, can just indicate on the, uh, the next poll uh, whether you had it prescribed for a medical purpose or um, and if not prescribed, did you smoke it, vaporize it, or eat it? Um, eating, I would include the sublingual drops um, or oil if it came in via that route. And, and we should note that in this uh, last poll, you can uh, choose more than one option. Uh, we're just the system's just waiting for the last responses from the last one. So let let me open this poll now. And again, you can choose more than one. The poll's now open. So far, the vast majority have smoked, um, which may not be surprising. Then uh, eaten is the uh, next option with about half as many having eaten as have, as have had uh, smoked, and then uh, half again have uh, vaporized cannabis. So you have smoked in the lead, half as many have eaten, and half again have vaporized. Right. Okay. So three quarters so it's by the inhalational route in some form or another. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Um, so a little more about um, cannabinoids. Um, we're talking about um, the, um, the exogenous um, molecules now, not our internal cannabinoids. Um, the, there's a whole load of different classes, and I'm not going to integrate great detail about these. It's sufficient to, to remember that there's a lot more to it than just CBD and, um, and THC. Um, there are more than 750 other metabolites in this um, uh, molecule called cannabichromine, CBN, also appears to be, uh, to be pharmacologically active. Um, there's um, a lot of non-psychotropic uh, molecules as well as the psychotropic tropic, uh, effects, and we really don't understand how they all work together. Um, we know that um, some of the research has been done to uh, extracting individual cannabinoids doesn't seem to show the same benefits of using mixes. So clearly there's something to do with the balance of the different molecules in uh, medicinal cannabis, uh, which is, has a value uh, on top of, of just uh, each individual compound. 
So the, um, the, the major uh, ingredient, though, as I think uh, most people are aware of, and certainly those of you that have smoked it or inhaled it recreationally, will be looking for is the, the THC. This is the primary psychotropic cannabinoid, the one that, um, that gets people high. Uh, but this is also the one that has uh, the effect on pain. Um, it also can have useful effects on nausea. Um, it can have an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and uh, interestingly, anti-itching effect as well. Uh, it's been used as a bronchodilator, um, which seems surprising in, when you, you have so many other toxic substances that are inhaled from smoking. Uh, but certainly that is something that uh, is, would warrant further research, especially from the vaporizing uh, perspective. Um, it has been used for a muscle relaxant, and patients with multiple sclerosis particularly have reported great help with muscle spasms. Um, there is some interesting work going on as well in use for Alzheimer's thin, uh, symptoms. And then cannabidiol is the other one, the non-psychotropic uh, component, and it has a, a great long list of um, potential uses there, which I'm not going to go through. Um, I did say I wasn't going to put in too many of the references, but I did include one in the middle because I thought it was a fabulous name. Um, so it was, uh, Dr. Booz is doing uh, research on cannabinoids. Um, there was a, there's another one that I did include here as well, Ligresti, uh, from 2006, uh, which was actually looking at the potential anti-cancer effect. Um, so medicinal use, um, there is, needs to be a balance, which is thought between the, the smell and the taste of, uh, of the product, um, and also a balance between the psychotropic and the non-psychotropic molecules. And many of the cultivators that have been producing um, um, hybrid strains of marijuana, they select and they breed and then process the product for the varying um, qualities. Um, and the optimal ratio between the THC and CBD has really not been determined, and it may be that there isn't an optimal ratio, and maybe that people find that different ratios are effective for different situations. Um, we know that CBD is responsible uh, for some of the uh, anti-anxiety effects, um, and we also know that appetite stimulation does require uh, uh, the THC. CBD on its own doesn't do much for the appetite. So uh, moving on to how you actually um, can access uh, cannabinoids, there are um, two drugstore products which are still available. We did have uh, Marinol or Dronabinol uh, for a while, and some research has been done on that, which I am going to talk about, uh, though Marinol is not actually available any longer in Canada. However, the Nabilone, which is the other THC analog, um, is still available, um, as is Sativex, which is the buckle spray. Um, it is very expensive. I had a patient uh, who, I, who was not interested in going to one of the dispensaries um, a little while ago, and I prescribed some Sativex for him, and uh, he phoned me back to say that the pharmacist said, said it was going to be $700 for his first prescription, which was three bottles. Um, so it, uh, we're not talking small change here. Um, this is the sort of thing you might get from one of the licensed producers, and I, uh, I'm not endorsing any particular product here, but this is just one variety where you can see on the labels they have these numbers, 17 to 1. Uh, that means 17% um, THC, 1% CBD, and then 12 to 0 in the middle, 12% THC, uh, still no CBD, and then um, the equal CBD, THC, 9% of both. So that's uh, one example. This is another uh, licensed producer um, uh, that produces a, a bigger variety, and they've uh, uh, labeled them according to colors. And you can see that there's a, a variety which goes way down um, from um, having uh, virtually no THC, just uh, 1%, with 17% CBD, all the way to um, the, the other extreme with the very high um, uh, amount of THC and no CBD at all. And each of the licensed producers will have um, similar uh, websites, uh, in website information uh, with similar ranges of, of products. Um, and there's a huge amount of internet misinformation out there. I downloaded this from the internet, and this wasn't a, a cynical, uh, you know, one of those funny websites. This wasn't meant to be in jest. This was actually a serious website. So what I thought I should do first is actually go through what the evidence is for a medical benefit. And I'm going to confine myself primarily to pain management, nausea and vomiting, and anorexia. Uh, but uh, where I have had information about other conditions, I'll mention it. Uh, but I haven't done any systematic searching the literature for that. And I'd like to just preface this a little bit with um, a, a summary of, of our experience at the Pain and Symptom Management Clinic in the Cancer Agency. Uh, Dr. Oja from Fraser Valley Cancer Center and two medical students worked together last uh, summer 
um, reviewing the charts from our patients that um, have had a, a tip to the cannabinoid box on our patient assessment. Um, and this, we, we went back right to 2005 when we started keeping systematic records of this. Um, we found 114 patients with a great variety of ages, all the way from 19 when we start taking patients to the agency to age of 90. Um, and that's only the ones that got it ticked as being a significant intervention. I'm not saying that this is all the patients over all that time that used um, cannabis or cannabinoids. I'm sure there were many more, but these are the ones that we knew about. Um, this was the main, the, the main reasons for use, primarily pain, nausea, and vomiting, a few for anorexia. Um, and the main product, uh, product used was cannabis in a variety of different forms, the majority being smoked or vaporized. Uh, but you can see quite a significant number also uh, on uh, Nabilone um, and a few on Sativex and a few on Marinol. And those that, um, that did use medicinal cannabis through our, our clinic or that we were aware of, 70% of them had no prior history of cannabis use. Uh, we found that out later. Um, so asking patients how they actually did, um, did with it, the vast majority had really no significant adver adverse effects. Uh, side effects uh, was the one that had uh, the most um, adverse effects. That was where only 70% um, uh, did well, 30% uh, didn't tolerate it well. And in terms of effectiveness for the condition with which it was being used, um, it varied between nearly 70% and 100%. But still the vast majority found it was benefit beneficial. Um, the least benefit was Navalone and making it as a tea, making cannabis as a tea. Um, and the people that had access to Marinol, edible marijuana, or smoked or vaporized, they were all at 100%. Like there wasn't, wasn't a single patient who uh, we were able to survey that, um, that, that said it, that it wasn't helpful. Um, so 18 patients of the 114 were still alive. Um, and we asked them about what symptoms they were treating. Um, and I'm not going to go into great detail on this slide, but you can see that pain, particularly nerve pain, sleep and appetite loss, were their primary reasons for using. Um, the effectiveness was actually pretty good for those primary reasons of, of using. But I would like to just point out with the appetite uh, and weight, there was a disparity there. People felt like they were eating more, but actually putting on weight, especially when you have advanced cancer, is a really tall order. And um, just slowing down weight loss would still be a very acceptable outcome, even if uh, people didn't manage to actually put on weight. Um, this is, these are the routes that were primarily used. Um, eaten in food was actually quite um, high. Um, the smoked uh, was uh, second highest, but there were a few having it by you know, pretty much um, all of the different routes. And the, uh, the daily dose was, the vast majority of them were in the, the less than three grams a day. We did have four very heavy uh, users who had been heavy recreational users prior to their cancer diagnosis and we're using quite inefficient extraction methods of uh, particularly making butter. So this is um, it's just a small subgroup. Uh, I think it, I, I mentioned this because there are a few people who do need these high doses, but, um, but the vast majority of people, especially the cannabinoid naive people, uh, would be consuming uh, less than three grams a day. Um, looking at the adverse effects, uh, people did have adverse effects. You know, 50% complaining of dry mouth, um, nearly 40% complaining of lethargy. Um, so they, this wasn't a, a completely benign treatment. But on the other hand, when you compare the cannabis to uh, other medications that they were using for the same indication, side effects of the other drugs were much worse. So over 60% reporting that cannabis compared very favorably. Um, so it's not side effect free or trouble free, but, um, but it can be very helpful and better than many of the other alternatives. So um, outside of our clinic, um, this is a, a, a whiz through the literature, for, for pain management, there have been some good studies with Marinol, um, especially in intractable non-cancer pain, um, cancer pain, and mul multiple sclerosis. Um, there have been some studies with Sativex, which is also known as Nabiximol. Um, and there, there are some um, uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled, and uh, crossover studies in, in peripheral and central neuropathic pain, as well as cancer pain. And there was a recent Canadian study which showed that the number needed to treat for uh, uh, the Viximols or Sativex was around five, which when you compare with gabapentin is pretty much the same. Pregabalin and gabapentin, the number needed to treat is between four and five. Tricyclic is a little less, around um, two to three percent, depending, around two to three uh, uh, per patient to benefit, uh, depending on what condition that you're looking for. 
Um, and then duloxetine doesn't perform as well as medicinal cannabis. Um, there have been some tests with other products, a variety of different um, THC, CBD mixes, but, um, but they've, there, there haven't been um, a huge number, so I'm not going to mention those in particular detail. Looking at the inhaled or vaporized cannabis, uh, they, uh, there was um, a study looking uh, at um, 23 patients, double bind, four period crossover study. So not a large number, but good methodology. Um, and it did show uh, that there was uh, some reduction in pain as compared with placebo. Um, there's been a, a double blind placebo controlled study on neuropathic non cancer pain with two doses, which also showed that vaporized cannabis was um, superior to placebo. And there has been benefit for smoke, smoke cannabis in HIV-related neuropathic pain. Uh, for those of you who don't, don't do a lot of HIV, um, ne HIV-related neuropathic pain is particularly difficult to treat, and a lot of the normal adjuvants like tricyclics and gabapentin have been found um, very uh, poor. It just doesn't seem to respond to those like other neuropathic pains do. So anything that's helpful, even in a minority, is still, uh, is still quite useful. So moving on to nausea and vomiting, um, looking at the prescription cannabinoids, um, there have been uh, quite a few studies on this. Um, about uh, 600 patients from various cancers when you add them all up. Um, and a, sort of a, a synthesis of the results is that nabilone uh, works better than procoperazine, also stematil, uh, known as stematil, also better than domperidone, which is, is very weakly antiemetic, um, and better than placebo. And in most of the studies, the patients who were using the active product favored continuous, uh, continuing to use it when the study finished. Um, a study with dronabinol, 14 control studies, again, over 600 patients, showed that uh, dronabinol or marinol was at least equivalent to metoclopramide and um, haloperidol and significantly better than chlorpromazine. So we don't use chlorpromazine much these days. And uh, both of the oral agents do clearly have some undesirable side effects, like dizziness, drowsiness, um, sometimes hallucinations, and euphoria. But again, you get to what's the lesser of the evils. Um, and remember, this is pure THC. This is a product that has no CBD in it at all. So then if you add the CBD by moving to a smoke cannabis or a side effects type of uh, preparation, there are some studies. Um, there, uh, the, there's the three controlled ones. Um, the first one only used smoke cannabis if the patient had failed Marinol, but still showed some success, so, um, so clearly some benefit by adding the CBD. Um, and there was a, a randomized double-blind placebo control crossover study um, with um, oral THC um, versus smoked cannabis. And 35% um, of them preferred the Marinol, 20% uh, preferred the smoked cannabis, uh, but um, m uh, many others had no preference. So it seemed to be uh, at least uh, equivalent. There was a little bit more in terms of cognitive uh, side effects in the oral dronabinol uh, group. So um, nausea and vomit vomiting, uh, again, large series of clinical trials in the US in the 1980s. Uh, they uh, looked at smoked cannabis uh, in over 700 and over 300 using oral THD capsules um, and found that um, the smoked and the oral THD were both quite effective. These were studies involving patients who were failing standard antiemetics like uh, dexamethasone and ondansetron, metoclopramide, procoperazine. And they found that, uh, especially in younger patients who maybe were more familiar with its recreational use, it was very well tolerated with few side effects. Um, there were the few studies that did compare the different routes found that inhalation worked better than oral, uh, but most of them uh, found that the, the results were better when it was up to the patient to control their dosing rather than a standardized smoking condition where you have to smoke a set amount of, um, of marijuana in a certain period of time. They have standardized cigarettes that were made, and you could cut them into quarters. It was quite interesting. Um, looking a little bit more at some modern studies comparing uh, the um, uh, cannabinoids with some of the, the newer drugs, like a preparant or olanzapine, which has been shown to be quite helpful. Um, just a, a small study showed that dronabinol or marinol was equivalent to ondansetron. Um, and um, even with a preparant and ondansetron, which is a standard kind of recipe, there are still treatment failures, and there's lots of anecdotal uh, reports of response to uh, cannabinoids um, in that situation. And clearly, we need to uh, study these a little more uh, going forward. So looking at the other indication for anorexia and weight loss, um, prescription cannabinoids, um, looking at Marinol, comparing with Megase, Megastrol acetate, 
um, megastroacetate or megase um, improved appetite by 75% as compared with dronabinol 49% and improved weight gain in 11% as compared with uh, marinol 3%. So it didn't perform as well as Megase, but it, it had, uh, they were only using it in a low dose and the toxicity was mostly comparable. And Megase does have some side effects, including hypercoagulability. Um, so this is um, something which is quite useful to show you know, there are other choices. A um, little bit more on smoked cannabis with anorexia um, and weight loss. Um, as you can see here, there were um, some studies um, looking at um, HIV. Um, the oral THC, uh, the marinol, and the smoked cannabis both uh, produced greater weight gain than placebo, and neither treatment had any effect on the actual uh, disease status, so uh, there wasn't any negative immune effect. Um, they did have a couple of people drop out uh, with uh, the cognitive effects, headache and nausea. Um, so uh, it's, yeah, it's something you see with all these studies. There are a few people who really don't tolerate it well. Um, looking at safety, is it possible to overdose? Uh, this, this is actually it's sort of a joke slide, this, because it's, it's really very difficult to uh, imagine how anybody could overdose on cannabinoids. But there was some old um, information suggesting that a lethal THC dose could be around 125 milligrams per kilogram. So if you actually do the calculations on that, uh, one joint contains about 20 milligrams of THC. So if you were an average weight person, you'd have to actually smoke 450 joints to get that much THC. But in actual fact, you only inhale about 50% of the THC, so you'd actually have to double that to be able to, uh, to smoke that much. And, um, and there's a picture here. Now, even if you had joints this big, it would be actually physically impossible to, to take a, in a dose of, of uh, medicinal cannabis that was uh, anywhere close to uh, being likely to kill you in terms of a direct effect. Um, but there are many other ways that people can die from use of drugs other than by um, direct toxicity, um, particularly looking at, um, at driving and um, uh, psychological issues like suicide and things like that. So I looked at what the data was out there for other forms of harm. Um, the, uh, the survey in 2001 indicated up here uh, said that 1.6% uh, of Canadians reported um, using cannabis for medical purposes, uh, but uh, there are uh, 21, well, nearly 22,000 uh, patients registered with the um, old Medical Marijuana Access Program as of uh, 2012, which represents about 5% of medicinal cannabis users uh, based on surveys of, um, of dispensaries. So the numbers are really huge. Um, when you look at recreational use, um, there was a survey in 2005 which had you know, over 13,000 respondents and nearly half of them reported uh, cannabis use, 14% uh, of them within the last year. Um, and another big survey in 2006 um, was estimated that of, uh, 97 million Americans of, uh, of over 12 years old have tried, uh, tried cannabis uh, recreationally. So there's a huge amount of cannabis consumption going on around the world. Um, and it's actually very, very hard to find any reports of significant harm um, there was a report which came out just this April when I was reviewing it to do this presentation, and there were two cases which were presented as cardiac deaths due to marijuana. Uh, of these two cases, they were both young men. One actually at post-mortem had quite severe previously undiagnosed heart abnormalities, and the other one had uh, multiple drugs in the system, so it was very hard to be clear as to whether it was, medicinal, whether it was marijuana or not. These are also high-dose uh, recreational users. And there has been another report, also just very recently out in um, JAMA of this April, from France, um, saying that they had documented some uh, people who had had uh, peripheral vascular uh, complications, uh, including stroke and heart attack, and some patients died. Uh, but it's very hard to separate those from uh, other substances that the people would be abusing, particularly tobacco, uh, and all were in the very high-dose recreational use context. So if you look worldwide at the statistics for toxicity, uh, the, the harm from cannabis appears to be much, much less than with many other drugs which we use regularly for the same indications, so opioids, anti-inflammatories, and tricyclics. Um, so going on to driving, um, there, does, there have been some good studies of uh, the effect of, of use of uh, cannabis on driving. And it appears that the effect is significantly less than with alcohol. 
people are affected. Um, people may drive inappropriately slowly. As mentioned, um, drivers under the influence of marijuana do retain this insight into their performance, so they'll, they'll slow down, they'll be more careful. As though, uh, as they, though there probably is some slight increased risk with uh, medicinal cannabis, it's nowhere near as bad as it is with alcohol. Another serious concern I'm going to spend a little bit of time on is um, schizophrenia because there have been some good studies with this. Um, it's actually quite difficult to separate out uh, the chicken and the egg argument with, um, with cannabis. Uh, people who are uh, psychiatrically uh, struggling and in distress may self-medicate with cannabis, uh, but cannabis may also uh, make things worse or even create problems. So there was a good study done in Dunedin, actually, where I worked for my five years in New Zealand before I came to Canada was in Dunedin, and I was actually aware of this study when I was working there. Um, this was an excellent study with um, a very uh, far-reaching... Um, uh, the, guy that, um, the guy that started it was, was amazing, that he thought so far ahead. He was planning for the next generation. And he got a, a birth cohort of uh, over 1,000 kids born in Dunedin in, um, in the early 1970s. And uh, they, the, the population there is pretty stable, so he was able to follow them. And they have nearly all of them are able to be, um, to be followed at the age of 26. And uh, near, oh, what, over uh, nearly three quarters of them had complete data on adult psychiatric outcomes, including um, what their, um, their, whether they've had any uh, psychotic symptoms in childhood, and also about illicit substance abuse. Um, so they divided up the, uh, the kids into three groups based on whether they'd used cannabis aged 15 and at 18, and they had 65% uh, who'd never used cannabis or only once or twice. Um, so they, they counted the once or twice as control. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide here with the results. Um, by the age of 26, those who had been users by age 15 and by age 18 had more schizophrenia symptoms than the controls. Uh, but you could say, well, maybe they were the ones who were going to get symptoms anyway. Um, so actually controlling for the psychotic symptoms at age 11, um, the, there was a still a risk for schizophreniform disorder, um, but the risk was reduced quite significantly. So it seems like there is a bit of both, and that people are self-medicating, but also that some people are, uh, more, are be being made more likely to get symptoms of schizophrenia because of heavy uh, marijuana use at an early age. So um, it, it, people who use cannabis when they're uh, quite young at a four times increased risk of having a diagnosis of schizophrenia at age 26 and control. So I think we have to have a, um, quite a healthy uh, respect for, for these concerns. Um, didn't seem to have any effect on depression, interestingly, um, and a use of other drugs didn't seem to predict schizophrenia outcomes over and above the effect of, of cannabis use, but there wasn't a whole lot of other drugs used in that study. Um, there was another study from Swedish conscripts, uh, which uh, had very similar uh, results, uh, though it wasn't anywhere near as methodologically rigorous as the Benedin study. So I think the bottom line is if you have any history of paranoid behavior or schizophrenia symptoms, either before or on treatment with cannabinoids, cannabinoids, it's best to discontinue immediately. Another harm which I wanted to include was, um, you know, the dog ate my meds. Med. Uh, we, we hear this a lot from patients who are actually selling their uh, opioid prescriptions. It's funny how the dogs never seem to eat the antibiotics, they're the antihypertensives. But in actual fact, they do eat meds. <laughs> uh, apparently, um, if you can read the small print here, uh, BC ranks number one in North America for the most pet insurance claims relating to marijuana toxicity, um, and it's, that it seems to be that um, they are attracted to the smell of it, and discarded joints do actually represent a quite a significant health risk for, for animals. So this might be something to warn patients about, um, and making sure that people discard their used joints uh, very safely. So what about addiction? Again, a lot of people are frightened of, uh, of cannabis because of the addictive potential. Um, and this is, is a real entity, but it's substantially less than with many other substances of abuse, uh, particularly cigarettes and alcohol, um, obviously opioids and cocaine way up there. Um, and when um, people do try to discontinue cannabis, there are multiple references and reports showing that um, there is a withdrawal syndrome, but it tends to be mild and short-lived. And uh, most people find that it's uh, have actually reasonably easy to quit if they want to. It's uh, considered comparable to nicotine withdrawal to, uh, for those that have been through it. 
Uh, I've heard people say it's a little bit like withdrawal from caffeine, which can also be quite difficult. Um, some of the modern strains of, um, of cannabis that are uh, much higher in THC than they were in the, uh, in the 1980s, um, would act, uh, it's being suggested that that might be more addictive. But in actual fact, um, having um, higher THG, THC strains has also been suggested to, um, to lead to people needing to smoke less. So therefore, you get less of the, the toxic substance from combustion, less tar. Um, so you may have um, less problems with toxicity from the actual smoking. Um, there has been concern about it being a gateway drug, uh, which is generally not a concern for uh, cancer patients. Um, and I, I think it is still something that, uh, that needs to be considered as an issue, but not so much in the, uh, the medicinal environment, but more in the recreational environment. In general, medicinal users really don't like to get high. They don't do anything they can to avoid that. They want to be normal. Uh, they want to approach normal from, from being unwell. They don't want to become um, abnormal. Um, so the cancer risk. Um, I always support the oral intake of cannabis products. Uh, vaporization is thought to be uh, a little safer, but again, not much data. Uh, but smoking um, is, is generally um, considered um, a, bad, a bad thing. Um, there, there is still, however, very poor data um, on, on how um, dangerous this is because of the confounding of, the, uh, of having so much tobacco involved as well. And when you try and correct for smoking and alcohol use, it doesn't appear to be uh, much of an effect, if any, um, on cancer uh, in relation to current or former cannabis use. Um, if you look at what actually comes out in a joint when you burn it, uh, there are some toxic substances. Um, and a few bronco alveolar lavage studies have shown some precancerous changes, um, like inflammation, dysplasia, celatidia, uh, that are it would make you think that it was likely that there would be a change, but again, it's difficult to separate those in people that are pure cannabis smokers because most people smoke some cigarettes as well. There is actually quite a bit of evidence now from animal and um, in vitro studies that there may be an actual anti-cancer effect of uh, some certain parts of the medicinal cannabis, and that needs a lot more study. So emphysema and COPD, again, very briefly, doesn't appear to have much of an effect, uh, if any. Uh, most recreational cannabis smokers are uh, tobacco smokers as well, and that seems to be the main problem. Um, there was a study done in Vancouver, which I mentioned particularly, um, and they looked at um, uh, older and younger patients, um, half of whom used cannabis, and found that there was no risk of COPD for smokers of only cannabis. Uh, the Dunedin study uh, actually did uh, respiratory function, lung function tests, and found that um, people that only smoked cannabis had a slightly increased uh, force vital capacity, but no change in other, any other markers. But these, these are young, now young adults. They're still not, not old. Um, a little bit on immune function. Um, one very small study did show some, show some effect on T cell function, uh, but it hasn't um, ever been replicated. And the HIV studies uh, have shown that there doesn't seem to be any um, negative impact. Um, there has been one um, case report of aspergillus contamination with, uh, with aspergillosis. Uh, but the aspergillus is actually quite easy to eradicate with heat, and one of the benefits of moving towards uh, a new licensed producer system is that all of the products will be tested, uh, and uh, we should be able to avoid that. Um, acute and chronic mental effects, um, clearly the euphoria, uh, especially with the high THC products, are, are very well documented, but a lot of studies of heavy chronic users haven't shown much effect at all. Uh, again, this is mostly in the uh, recreational area, uh, but we have the benefit of having that group of patients that have had some research, uh, and I'm sure that those, that research is uh, extrapolatable to people that use it uh, uh, medicinally. Um, medic uh, marijuana and uh, cannabinoids should be avoided in pregnant patients, if at all possible. Obviously, that's not something we see that often in cancer patients, uh, but in cancer survivors, that may well be a case. Um, there haven't been any uh, studies showing an increased risk of childhood cancer in the offspring of women who smoked, smoked uh, during pregnancy, but there uh, may, be, may well be some effect on mental function um, because the, uh, the brain is forming, obviously, uh, when, the, when you're being exposed to the, um, to the, the smoke. So cautions, quick summary slide here, don't drive after consuming, about three hours after inhale, inhaled um, or 10 to 12 hours after oral. Um, try and avoid uh, cannabis in young patients, especially if there's a history of mental illness um, if, or if there's a 
personal or strong family history of schizophrenia. Obviously, if someone's got significant heart or lung disorders, you want to avoid the smoking route and try and use another route instead. Um, and then we need to be very careful uh, when people are using other sedatives or uh, hypnotics because of the potential compounding of the, uh, of the psychoactive effect. Avoid in pregnancy and breastfeeding. And if someone's got severe organ failure, um, kidney or liver, um, you do need to metabolize the cannabinoids that have to be released um, you know, from your body. And if your organs aren't working very well, you may get a, 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 a prolonged uh, effect, uh, effect much more than uh, with somebody who gets rid of it quickly. So my last slide in this section is um, really we need to do a lot more study on this with, uh, with the more modern cannabis strains. And we've only recently uh, been able to um, even have discussions about getting access to actual cannabis to be able to do research. And there's still a lot of politics getting in the way of this despite decades of, of demand for, these, uh, for more research in this area. So we've got a few minutes left here for some questions. If you'd like to open it up there, Michael. Sure. If anybody has any questions for Dr. Holly, you can send them to me via the chat function. Or alternatively, you could um, email them to me at uh, communication at painbc.ca, and we can um, add them to the list to answer in part two. We've still got seven minutes here, Michael, as well, so I've got through that quicker than I thought I would. Oh, that's no problem at all. Um, Not I having do, faces I, yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did want to uh, let people know. I'll just take the presenter status back for a second here. Um, let's see. It looks like we might have some questions coming in. Hold on. Um, we have a question regarding um, official Ministry of Transportation rules on driving when using marijuana for medicinal purposes. Do you have any uh, idea on those things? Um, no, at this point there aren't any. There aren't any official rules. Um, it's general general good advice: don't drive when high. But there is not such a thing as a um, like a breathalyzer test where you could do a minimal uh, level, like a certain level of cannabinoid that would be considered toxic. Um, so no, at this point it's it's really just general advice. Right and. Um, Another question here from our attendees. Have there been any studies done concerning the potential long-term effects of oral ingestion? Not as far as I'm aware, no. The, uh, it would be lovely to be able to get some of, of those um, studies done, but we just haven't had access to any products to be able to, uh, to test them. Mm -hmm. Certainly there's nothing that's been shown with Marinol or Navalone, uh, but, um, but actual cannabis, uh, we haven't had any any product to be able to test. Right. Um, well, if that's it for questions for now, uh, Dr. Holly, I'd like to uh, thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon and explaining um, or sharing your, your expertise on medicinal cannabis.